Okay, go ahead, August. Thanks, Jess. Um, I'm going to start here. If you have any questions or anything comes up, uh, Jess will be watching the chat for us. So feel free to uh, type in anything that catches your attention, and we'll try to deal with that at the end. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a summary of our progress. And I'm going to start with the ACPF Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework system uh, built on the ESRI platform using the GIS software, ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Desktop. Uh, it requires the spatial analyst extension and makes extensive use of uh, Python and uh, open source software from U uh, Utah State. It is designed by the ARS in conjunction with uh, NRCS. And the idea was to try to uh, use GIS to identify locations that are suitable for particular NRCS practices that would allow a user to uh, review uh, an entire watershed, in our case, the Huck 12 watersheds, uh, to find locations in one go for the various practices. Uh, it focuses on surface runoff and tile drainage management practices in the infield, below field, and what I call the along field uh, settings. It assumes that the watershed will be undergoing a watershed-wide uh, planning effort in conjunction with this, as well as uh, specific farm scale uh, practices like for our uh, soil health and nutrient improvement and uh, whole farm conservation planning. But uh, we do get a, as results of the practices, a full range of sites that are identified you know, explicitly as potential locations and an estimate of how much land they'll uh, use, how much land they'll treat, and uh, how the watershed will be processed by all of these various practices in conjunction. It, it uh, sort of avoids the farm by practice review and allows the conservation practitioner to try to take a, a more zoomed out view and review some of the uh, synergistic effects of being able to apply multiple practices across the watershed. We've talked, uh, I believe, in five or six previous uh, Lunch and Learns about uh, various practices in particular. Uh, the first one we did, it was nutrient reduction wetlands. And uh, we've used the same watershed in Western Ohio for all of them. And I think what is really pretty impressive is that we use some uh, data that's based on farm fields and evaluate the fields individually across the watershed. And in this case, there's, you know, 11, almost 1,200 water uh, fields that were evaluated in this almost 28,000 acre watershed. Um, we, depending on the watershed and the general shape of it, how much ag is in it, uh, how the uh, watershed is drained by surface water conveyance, like ditches and streams, as well as how flat it is and how it's drained by subsurface or tile drainage, uh, we get different results. And one of the things that we've noticed in comparing watersheds in the watersheds that we've done these evaluations in is that uh, changes in those context, the how flat the land is, how much ag there is, it really changes the results. 
in the outputs of, for example, uh, how many nutrient reduction <laughs> wetlands are identified or grass waterways. But uh, the Nature Conservancy has worked with a vendor, Heartland GIS, who has helped us uh, conduct almost 90 of these Huck 12 watershed runs. And the results, although are unique to each watershed, we see a consistent pattern of uh, sites that are identified that are potential locations for uh, these practices that could be uh, implemented that we can't say for certain, but likely are not implemented yet. Uh, this, the wetland, uh, nutrient reduction wetlands in particular are pretty obvious when you look at them in aerial photography. Uh, so you can tell whether they've been uh, installed or not. And uh, there's often many opportunities out there. Now, these are not necessarily uh, specific sites for these practices. There's a lot of uh, information that's not included, like uh, other easements, uh, power line easements, or whatever it might be that might prevent the siting of the uh, practice in that specific location, uh, land ownership issues, um, or even uh, when engineers or go out to a site and uh, do actual measurements, the result may not be suitable for for that. But uh, this is definitely a, a provides you with a set of opportunities that could be potentially uh, in place and specifically where and which landowners in the watershed would qualify. Now that's that's a very useful thing for things like uh, this whole watershed planning where you're developing uh, nine element plans or the uh, non-point source plans uh, where you want to be able to say, uh, we would like to try to develop this re uh, nutrient reduction practice in the watershed, and we have identified this many uh, locations that would be suitable for various practices. So then you would, you know, have an explicit goal that you were trying to work toward. But uh, again, I want to keep going back to this. That it's the sum of the output that I think is especially impressive that uh, not just which farm would be suitable for grass waterways, but all of the farms might be. And these are the, well, I don't know exactly how many specific farms, but there are 280 almost uh, grass waterways that were identified in this one Huck 12 uh, that very often don't exist yet. Um, in addition to the, the ones that we've discussed, there were a set, there's a set of data that come out of ACPF that are uh, ancillary, not necessarily precision practices, but that do also have NRCS practices available to uh, complete uh, contour buffer strips or sort of like uh, the grass waterways. They fall into the same sort of basket, but uh, the uh, depressions, uh, ACPF identifies uh, depressions greater than a certain size that contain greater than 60% hydric soils, uh, which could identify locations that are suitable for, you know, uh, buffer development or uh, different types of uh, drainage issues. Uh, the WASCOBs, you know, surface water uh, velocity reduction type practices, uh, more common in uh, landscapes that are uh, with greater topographic variation. And I mean, just here in this watershed, two ponds uh, that the, the tool will identify as places that could possibly, again, help with uh, water quantity management and in the process, water quality uh, improvements. So there's, there's uh, in specific practices, but then there's also data that goes along with this, like uh, uh, mean farm slope, uh, risk uh, runoff risk reduction, uh, all sorts of ancillary 
uh, data that comes with it that uh, could be very useful for other planning efforts in, in addition to the specific siting of uh, NRCS practices. Now, as I mentioned, the Nature Conservancy has done uh, a, a set of Western Ohio Huck 12s. I think it's 86 Huck 12s, uh, but we're part of a larger community of practitioners in Ohio who have uh, developed ACPF runs elsewhere in Ohio. So there's a lot of work being done in Western Lake Erie Basin, uh, a lot of work being done that's not uh, depicted here on this map uh, in uh, Southwest Ohio in Claremont County, for example. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a, a big effort and the Nature Conservancy has been working with other practitioners to try to establish a community of practice around this. Um, one of the things that is an important part of this is the development of the data that is used to create ACPF runs. Uh, there's a set of data that needs to be brought in processed and, and harmonized so that you can then use that to develop further data, the outputs that I've discussed. And this uh, slide on the right uh, shows where in Ohio we have official base level ACPF geodatabases. So if you could go to that address on the bottom click on one of those watersheds and you would be able to download the, the, the base level data that you could then carry out the uh, processing without any further effort. Um, again, this, doesn't, uh, this map doesn't indicate some of the watersheds that we know are out there, but uh, there are other watersheds out there and being able to keep track of all of that and being able to manage all of that is how we've been using the uh, larger community of practice. And I think, Jess, that might be something that you could talk about a little bit. Okay, great. Thanks, August. Yeah, we're going to transition from August as our uh, our GIS technician and helping run through the tool and do these model runs and more into where are we at now with the model? What is the collaboration that's happening? Uh, what do we know? What do we not know? And what are the next steps? So again, August had uh, walked through some of the benefits of this toolbox and why we jumped into using it and why we like it. Um, the data layers are great. It cites and plans for these edge of field practices that we know are so crucial to managing water quality and quantity in addition to the infield practices. Um, and as well as what we like about this tool is that it gives us this hydro condition GIS layer, which is not something that's easily um, available or able to obtain by um, you know, the public at large. So that we really like that and that we know that, that a tool like that can be used for a lot of different reasons beyond um, just the, um, the planning efforts of this tool alone. So that's, those are some of the reasons we jumped into this. And as we had conversations with our NRCS partners and EPA partners, there was a lot of interest in our university partners. There's a lot of interest in trying to bring the tool to Ohio. What could the benefit be statewide? Um, should there be a benefit statewide and how do we go about doing that? And that's when we got in touch with a lot of different people using this tool um, and trying to figure out how to use it, why to use it, where to use it. Um, and so really over the last year, and I wanna um, highlight the Joyce Foundation for making it possible for TNC to be able to work on this at the level that we have been is really we saw that there were different way, a tool is only, a model is only as good as the data that goes into it and also only as good as um, the outputs that come out of it and how you can communicate those and share those. Um, and so we saw there was a wide variety of uh, ways that you could get output, parameters around the tool that you can click, the buttons you can click to get the outputs. And we saw that there was a real need to standardize um, the pre-processing data 
that goes into the tool, the hydro conditioning and the ground truthing that needs to happen to make sure that the tool is giving you the right answers or close to the right answers. Um, and then the uh, uh, making sure that the outputs were as standardized as they could possibly be for the, um, for the nuances of the modeler and the nuances of the geography where it was being run. So that's really where we have been spending a lot of our efforts and that kind of developed into two, two main um, areas of work. And that was getting a community of practice together, like August mentioned, of modelers. So the technical people around this tool, so they would have this standardization and agreed upon set of protocols to use and nuances. And really that was useful and helpful because we brought this tool over from Iowa. Um, and, it, and we have unique landscapes here, unique soils, um, especially in this ultra flat landscapes that we have in Northwest Ohio um, that maybe weren't captured in the tool or kind of tricky or giving tricky results. Um, so how to handle that and, and giving some guidance around that. So having an annotated user guide, not a brand new user guide, but an annotated user guide and some standardized procedures that people can work through. So they know that once they pick up the tool and get results, they're gonna have similar answers to somebody else who has picked up the tool. Um, and so we wanted to track also who was doing what, who was using this. So we weren't duplicating efforts and that we weren't um, double spending money we didn't need to spend and we can communicate that to, to others around as well. Um, so we wanna track who's doing what and August showed that in some of the maps and that's kind of an ongoing thing. You know, as soon as you make a map or a list, it's outdated. So we're trying to do our best to keep up with that. Um, and you could see all of the folks who are working on this through their um, logos below. And I think I captured everybody we've been working with. I apologize if I, if I left you out, um, let me know that in the chat if you're on this call. Um, and, um, and really what we wanna do is we started off in Ohio, but we really know that the, the tri-state area and the Western Lake Erie Basin is part of this. And so uh, we are working with and reaching out to our Indiana partners. I know a lot of you are on the call today. Thanks for joining. Um, we know a little bit about what's going on up in Michigan. Um, and so just trying to make sure that as a region and as a watershed, uh, we, are, we have this available to everybody if they wanna use it. Um, uh, as the modeler team and uh, the technical community of practice team uh, dove into the conversations and the tool, there really were some research needs and info needs that, and, that were identified and really around how, um, can you go back to the last slide, August? Sorry. Um, how, um, how good is the tool? How much ground truthing do we really need? Um, information like that. A uh, real big area of concern, a real big, uh, and some folks are working on this, uh, American Farmland Trust in Ohio State, for example, and then actually some of our counterparts are thinking about this in Indiana uh, with the Nature Conservancy is how do we link this tool and its outputs to nutrient reductions and uh, potentially what the watershed scale models that give us our nutrient outputs and estimates of nutrient outputs if we have practices. So linking those two together to show that larger impact, um, not just practices on the ground. And so where we're, where we're heading towards now is really we needed to create this well, Iowa um, and the ACPF hub has been really great and an awesome resource and they have really great training materials on their website. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had um, a little more control of our own data in this region and we were able to know where the most updated information was and have and be able to track that. So as August showed you, the hub is great in Iowa, but it's not quite fully updated with how fast we're moving with the pace of work here. Um, and so we want a little more control of that. So we have made a um, connection to the knowledge exchange at Ohio State University um, and working with Ohio State University Extension. And we're working towards creating, um, it's not our own hub, but it will, I think the, the framework that USDA is working with is saying a spoke onto the hub so that we would be a regional center where you could get data and resources. Um, and um, and that, that could link to the Iowa team. The Iowa team would own the tool, they would update the tool, they would make that update available to all users and that we would know where our data are and uh, where our outputs are for our own region within our own knowledge hub. So that is in progress now, and we're having really good conversations with all of our land grants in Heidelberg around that. And we're actually gonna provide an update to you on that at the WLEB partnership meeting um, over the next couple of weeks. So you'll hear more about this 
um, as we develop more and where we've agreed the technical modeling team has agreed to stay together and meet quarterly and just keep working as a community of practice and some of our next steps are to have a standard operating procedure for the um, for the hydro conditioning layer. We have a good one for the pre-processed data sets. We also want to work towards engaging the private sector and then sharing what we've learned with them and making sure that we are um, we are communicating uh, how we're using the tool and making sure that the private sector is synced up to the public sector using the tool. Um, so if you want to contract with the private sector, you can do that and have confidence, or maybe we can help you with a, a scope of work to give to a, um, the private entity. Um, so you know how, get a sense for how much it should cost you, what the scope of work would be, what the timeline can be, and you can negotiate your own contracts that way. So that's a service we'd like to provide. Um, and then we want to keep doing model runs and provide this information to users and to the state and to the region um, so people can see the outputs of the model, but do that in a way that still protects uh, personal privacy. This model gets very detailed and you can get down to the field level um, pretty, pretty well. And that's, that's another reason we like the tool, but we also wanna make sure that we're protecting privacy and protecting people's data while we're also sharing information about what's going on out there. Um, so that's the, that's the technical modeling community of practice. And uh, most of these logos here are part of that effort. And then we have our state um, and region quarterly roundtable, we're calling it. And uh, we meet roughly quarterly. We've been doing a pretty good job. That's really where we start to bring in our research and university partners, our, all of our state agencies that want to participate. The Nature Conservancy has been part of that. Um, and we really start to look at the bigger picture of identifying our state and regional needs and funding opportunities um, that are available. And one of the things and one of the reasons this kind of got onto our radar screen that we haven't really talked about too much, August kind of mentioned it was really having this link to non-point source nine element plans and really helping, um, helping developers of those plans come up with that project list at the end. And this is a way to help them figure out what that project list is and then go after funding to, to get those projects on the ground. So that's one of the reasons um, that this is gonna stay on our radar screen a little bit longer. We know those plans are, uh, we wanna get those done in as many HOC 12s, if not all of them as possible. So hopefully there'll be a companion ACPF toolbox run done with them. So August, next slide. Um, so what, what are our next steps? I kind of went into that a little bit. We want to engage the private industry and consultants. We want to still provide technical assistance to new model users. And TNC is available to do that. Uh, we've done that for a few counties already. Some of you are on the call. Thanks for joining the call today. And if you, as you pick up the tool and have questions about it, uh, August is available to answer really detailed technical questions <laughs> about that. Um, and you're also welcome if you are uh, if you are using the model, uh, you can join our team or pop in on our meetings if you'd like to. So we want to provide that um, assistance to people. Uh, we definitely want to build out this hub and all the data repositories. We want to make data available to people. We want to know that it's pre-processed in a, in a standardized way, as I said, and make that freely available. Um, and that most likely will happen through the Knowledge Exchange and uh, Central State University and Ohio State University are working together to make that happen, as I mentioned. Uh, we're really working on how do we share the model outputs. We haven't quite landed on the best way to do that, whether that'll be a story map type of output or um, some kind of a login service through the hub, um, but that's it's ongoing conversations. We're open to suggestions there. Um, and then really we want to identify opportunities to put this conservation on the ground. So that's how do you, how do you link this uh, modeling and planning effort to funding opportunities, to grants, and to uh, knowing that these uh, practices that will go on the ground or, or can be planned are helping us meet our water quality goals that we have. So opportunities is, is a start there because that's a whole broad category of things that we're still having discussions around. So with that, um, again, just the real highlights of what we think some of the benefits are of using this uh, toolbox. <laughs> Uh, how the benefits it can bring to you, um, and then just some contact information of where to go. Again, Nature Conservancy is available to be a technical resource or to link you with others uh, or to show you where some data sets are. And then the Ag Planning 
framework website, acpf4watersheds.org is a really nice resource. They're gonna start doing and have started doing a lot of lunch and learns and a lot more training opportunities. So that's why this one will be a last for us, um, at least for now. And um, with that, if there are any questions, I can take questions now. Okay, we've got one in the chat here. Thank you. Do we work with USDA IRS uh, in, and the developers of the tool? I didn't see them mentioned. Um, and are you uploading your results to the hub portal or is that just the one you described with Ohio State? Good questions. Yes, we are working with USDA ARS. See, like I said, once you put logos on a slide, you, you forget somebody. So ARS has been really involved with us and really um, the developers of the tool have been super helpful and super engaging with us and want to help us bring the tool to Ohio. So we have been working with them. And then um, Sarah Porter, who is now with Environmental Working Group, she was with ARS and an early developer of the tool. She's been She's on our technical uh, modeling committee. So we have been working with them. Uh, and we are working with uh, NRCS in Ohio and then through ARS to figure out how we distribute this tool and get it out um, in Ohio. Um, so part of the tricky part with the hub is yes, we can upload, so that's, we'll call it the mothership. Okay, so there's our effort regionally and in Ohio and then the mothership. Um, so yes, we can send information and data to the mothership but um, it, it would, right now it's kind of upon us to do that if we wanna get it updated. And you can see there's a little bit of a lag between where we are and what, what the mothership shows. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we had a second or a backup, but ultimately, yes, we wanna have that seamless transition or that seamless communication between what we have in Ohio and, and in the region and then what the mothership is able to share and show. Um, hopefully that answered your questions. Where are the recorded lunch and learn sessions you've posted? We have a few available early on that we did early in the year um, on our YouTube channel. Um, Steph, can you help me uh, put the YouTube channel link in the chat? And, um, and then we'll, um, we'll package these up all as a series and then we'll kind of make this whole package. We have about seven or eight of them now that we'll make available on that YouTube channel site for everybody. Uh, we'll make it look pretty and, and have it be a nice little package for you. Um, okay, what about the environmental working group are we coordinating? So I mentioned that a little bit. The environmental working group has a grant to do all of the pre-processed data sets for every HUP 12 in the Western Lake Erie Basin. That's Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. And they're well underway doing that. And then I believe they're doing a subset of HUP 12s, mainly in Michigan, where they're undertaking another analysis with the tool. So, um, and again, Sarah's on our team. We're working closely with Environmental Working Group. She's been a great resource. Um, so that's how we're collaborating with them and connecting with them. And that's an ongoing thing. Um, you're welcome. Thanks for uh, listening to the chat. Uh, we wanna provide these updates as often as we can, either through uh, big statewide or regional meetings like the WLED partnership, or if there's big news to share, for example, when we have a hub set up or when we have some information to share, we can we can probably set up another one of these as they happen, but we don't want to duplicate efforts with the communications um, that are already out there. Um, thanks for the really great questions, everybody. We're right just about at the end of our time. I'd be happy to stay on a little longer and take more questions if you have them, or feel free to reach out to August or myself um, at any time. And then Stephanie did just check out the chat if you're online. Uh, that is our YouTube channel. It's TNC Agriculture YouTube channel. It's it's some of these recordings and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff we do on there that we record like webinars and uh, practice uh, videos and stuff. Uh, okay. We're right at the end of time. So I understand if you have to drop off, we did get one message in here. Uh, unfamiliar names on the call. Um, so I'd say there's a there's a mixed bag of folks here today. There's some agency folks of the names I recognize. There's some Sun Water District folks. Um, there are some um, municipal folks that I recognize. Um, some uh, state and regional federal folks. Um, so if if I didn't mention your category, there's a couple of uh, university folks on here. Um, 
feel free to kind of put that in the chat of, of the sector that you represent, and floodplain managers potentially. Um, and then if you would like to evaluate this and give us your feedback on how this went, any more additional information you'd like to see like this or something different or deeper dives, there is an evaluation form in the chat. Please click on that link. It's a real short evaluation and that helps us gauge the interest and gauge um, uh, what we can bring to you into the future. Okay, we have a Mich Michigan State person on board. Thanks, Jeremiah, it's good to see you, sort of. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your week.